We live in a dangerous world, right? We, we are surrounded by threats to both our personal well-being and a, the functioning society as a whole. Uh, on, that, on that latter concern, um, some social commentators this week have been discussing a topic uh, that was raised by a few recent articles in The Economist. Uh, the Economist is Britain's most influential news magazine. It's this, what is the biggest issue the world is facing today? It's the biggest issue the world is facing. What, what is the biggest threat to the economies of most nations, and thus to the functioning of those societies? What is it? They say it's not the threat of nuclear war, as real as that may be. It's not the threat of, of rogue nations invading their neighbors, as serious as that clearly is. It's not pandemics, or a climate crisis, or riots, or wildfires, or indictments of politicians. No, it's, it's not any of the things that politicians and so-called journalists most often talk about. According to these articles, it's probably what they refer to as the great global baby bust. The ever-falling birth rate of most advanced nations, where the birth rate is the total number of births per woman. For example, the birth rate in South Korea has plummeted to 0.8. That's less than one birth per woman in that nation. Well, the human replacement rate is 2.1. You have to have an average of 2.1 births per woman in order for the population just to remain steady. In South Korea, in Hong Kong, and Puerto Rico are under 1.0, with Ukraine and China and Spain and Italy and Japan only slightly better off. Even America's birth rate has fallen to 1.7. 1.7, that's well below the required 2.1 replacement rate. This is a big deal. As a nation grows older, if the number of people leaving the workforce continues to grow faster than the number of people who are entering the workforce, the economy will eventually collapse. And that's true uh, regardless of whether or not you have a, a social security system like ours or like France's that is utterly dependent on as many people uh, working and, and having as much money paid into it as is being drawn from it at any given time. Even apart from a system like that, and that looming disaster that faces us, uh, there's no way around the fact that people consuming goods and services are dependent on other people to produce those goods and services. If there's not enough workers, there will not be enough goods and services. Civilization will collapse. Turns out that, that spurning God's good gift of children and ignoring his command to be fruitful and multiply has disastrous consequences. For a self-centered, self-serving civilization. But zooming in and, and more closely considering your personal well-being at any given time, what's the biggest danger that you face? If that's what's the biggest danger a, a civilization faces, what's the biggest danger you face? Well, if politicians and pundits are largely silent on the biggest issue facing civilization, well, how much more silent on the biggest threat to each person's soul? I invite you to turn with me to James, chapter 2, verse 14. You can find it on page 230 in the second half of the Pew Bible. James, chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord to you. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? Well, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now, but someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Well, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father 
justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. You see that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for and humbly come to your word. Lord, grant us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to believe and obey. Bless the preaching of your word. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, James began this letter, chapter 1, verse 1, by addressing the topic of faith. Uh, specifically, uh, how the trials that we face in life test our faith. They either strengthen that faith or they expose it as being fake. He then explained how the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, which he refers to as the word of truth, how it's able to save your souls. He explained how the gospel is the means by which the Father gives us new birth and transforms us into the, the first fruits of his new creation. But, he says in verse 22 of chapter 1, uh, we must be careful not to deceive ourselves into thinking that merely having heard God's word of truth saves us. For we must be doers of the word and not hearers only. Saving faith is a, a living faith. It's a faith that increasingly makes us more like our Heavenly Father. James closed out chapter 1 uh, by introducing, introducing three marks of this living faith, three signs of life. And it's these three fruits of faith that, that structure the remainder of the letter. Summarize them with three C's. One, control our tongue. Two, concern for needs of others. And three, countering the corrupting influence of the world. These are the signs of life of a living faith. Control of our tongues, concern for the need of others, and more generally, countering the corrupting influence of the world. That's the end of chapter 1. Chapter 2 then begins uh, with a further focus on that second category, concern for the needs of others. He, he focuses on the topic of, of showing partiality uh, toward the rich at the expense of the poor, thus violating the royal law of love. And James concluded that section, chapter 2, verse 12, uh, with these very challenging words. He says this, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment, that is the final judgment to come, is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. He's saying that if, if merciful concern for others and their needs is not a mark of your life, well, he's saying that you are not a person who knows what it is to have had your greatest need met which means that you have not received God's mercy towards your sin. Because mercy received always leads to mercy shown. And thus we see that the biggest danger facing the souls of professing Christians is not warring nations or natural disasters. It's not criminals or, or cancer or climate. It's self-deception. Thinking that you have saving faith when you don't. Because the biggest danger is not what threatens your earthly life. The biggest danger is what threatens your eternal life. And that's what our passage is all about. Turning again to, to verse 14. He says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Notice how James makes clear that he, he's not talking about someone who actually has faith, but rather someone who says he has faith, but does not have works. It's the same person from chapter 1, verse 26, who thinks he is a religious person, but deceives his heart, and whose religion is worthless. That is, it's empty, it's phony, it's a fraud. A so-called faith 
that is empty of loving mercy towards others is not the kind of faith that saves. That's James's point. He then provides an illustration, and that also works as a kind of application of his point. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed, meaning inadequately dressed for the elements, and lacking in daily food, meaning falling short of their daily needs, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled. That is saying a blessing over them, praying for God to meet their needs, but without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? I mean, it's, it's quite a, a challenging word. We've all been confronted with requests for charity that we have denied. We know how it feels to be the one giving a blessing without having met the need. And we know that, at least in, in some instances, our denial of the need was at least partially driven by an unwillingness to part with our money, money that we'd rather spend on ourselves, and usually not even on our most pressing needs, but on relative luxuries. Now, we're quick to point out uh, the other motivations uh, that are also mixed in with that decision, such as genuine concern for what kind of charity helps and what kind of charity hurts. But we need to be careful uh, not to be too quick to brush aside James's challenge here with first, uh, without first letting it weigh heavy upon our hearts and our minds. Uh, noting that the numerous ways that, that helping can cause more harm than good well, that's just one way to brush off these verses. Another way that we might be tempted to brush aside these very challenging and difficult verses is to focus on the difference between James's society and our society. What with our tax-funded welfare system that provides a safety net for those who fall on hard times and, and thus an avenue for them to get back on their feet. Some truth to that. We must not let that just dismiss what James is saying here. A third way we might try to brush aside these verses is, is to rightly note that James is not providing an exhaustive treatment on how to go about caring for the poor and needy here. In fact, that's not even his main point. This challenge about charity is just one illustration of the need for the kind of faith that bears the fruit of good deeds. This illustration is quickly followed by two other illustrations that have nothing to do with charitable giving. And so clearly, a, a broader principle is at play. All right, so can we just brush aside these uncomfortable verses? Noting that one, helping often hurts. Two, our society is different than James's. And three, this is not an exhaustive treatment of caring for the poor and needy. Can we use that to brush this aside? No, I, I don't think that we can. God has spoken these words for our edification. I think it's right that we take a moment to dwell on the picture that he paints here with this illustration. I think it's right to let it expose the, the traces of selfishness that still linger in our hearts. Now, yes, obviously God does not insist that we, we satisfy every single request for charity that comes across our path. For most of us, that would be impossible and irresponsible. Be irresponsible with respect to our own obligation to first meet the needs of our natural family and, and then those of our family of faith before meeting those of strangers. Even the illustration here focuses on those who can be called a brother or sister in Christ, the family of faith, not on random people outside of the church. It would also be irresponsible uh, just to satisfy every request that comes to us uh, given the ways that helping so often hurts. Over time, I've changed my, my practice in this regard. I, I no longer give cash to anyone. Now, I'm not making that a law for you. I'm just saying that I have become convinced that uh, that usually does more harm than good. But that doesn't mean I don't do anything. Uh, for those who, who call or approach me, say, here in the office at the church, I direct them to where they can find uh, both short-term emergency assistance and, and longer-term assistance. Organizations that we as a church, and I personally help to fund. Direct them there. I also have some emergency assistance bags on hand that a member of the church has, has generously provided for those who come by the office in desperate need and who, for whatever reason, can't get to the food pantry across the street or to one of the need locations or CEC or a community table or another food pantry in a timely manner. 
I sometimes keep some of those, those emergency assistant bags uh, in my truck as well uh, for the street corner beggar, though many of them just scoff at it and that kind of help they turn aside. But the point is, uh, we do need to take James's challenge to heart. We need to ask whether the fruit of charitable mercy is evident in our life in, in some way. Because if it's not, James is saying that should trouble us. As he writes in verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The faith that saves does good to others. As one writer put it, if your faith does not benefit others, it will not benefit you either. Verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Uh, James is, is introducing a hypothetical opponent in this diatribe, one who argues that some people have faith, other people have works, we shouldn't expect everybody to have both. And James says that's nonsense. Continuing verse 18, he replies, show me your faith apart from your works, which can't be done, and I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, James is saying there's no such thing as faith that does not produce the fruit of charitable mercy. There's no such thing as works that are pleasing to God that don't issue forth from, from faith. Faith and works are inseparable. Where there is faith, there will be works. Where there is new birth, there will be new life and the signs of that life. John 13, 35, Jesus said, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. They will know we are Christians by our love. Verse 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. What? Well, that's an interesting comparison, isn't it? Comparing nominal Christians, Christians who are Christians in name only, comparing them with demons. What's he saying here? He's saying the nominal Christian, quote, believes that God is one. That is, that God is the only true God and that there is no other. That's the most foundational truth of the Hebrew Bible. It's articulated in what is known as the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, kind of the most famous verse of the Torah, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That's the Shema, known by every Hebrew. James is saying, great, you believe the most fundamental truth about God. So what? Even the demons believe this. But what good is that to them? Saying the faith that saves is more than mere belief in the truth. The faith that saves is more than mere belief in the truth. I've shared this part of my, my personal testimony uh, before, but Every time I, I look at James chapter 2, verse 19, it comes to mind for me. Up until the time I was 13, I was self-deceived into thinking that I was a Christian when I wasn't. I knew the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believed it to be true. I professed that Christ was my Lord and Savior. But my so-called faith was no better than that of the demons. In fact, it was worse. At least the demons know they're not right with God. They shudder in the fear of their coming judgment. But like all nominal Christians, I was worse off than that because I mistakenly thought that I was right with God, that I had nothing to fear, and thus did not shudder. But the Lord had mercy on me at that young age. He opened my eyes to see that my so-called faith wasn't faith. For I had never truly trusted in Jesus to save me. I trusted merely in my knowledge about Jesus. It's not the same thing. I always give the, the parachute analogy at this point to illustrate it. Uh, you've heard it before. If you're in an airplane uh, and the engines go out, you are going to die unless you have a parachute. Uh, but knowing that the parachute is there to save you, Knowing that, believing that it can save you, will not save you. 
Your knowledge of it, your belief in it will not save you. You have to put it on. And you have to jump. You have to fully entrust your life to that parachute. Fully entrust your life to it. Actively resting in its saving grasp. In the same way, knowing and believing that Christ can save you, will not save you. You must put on Christ like that parachute. You must fully entrust your salvation to Him, actively resting in His saving grasp. And until you make that jump, until you let go of everything else that you're clinging to, until you abandon all hope apart from Jesus, then whatever it is that you're calling faith will not benefit you and will not benefit others. The faith that saves is more than mere belief in the truth. It's a, it's a humble, life-giving trust that bears fruit in the lives of those who have it. There's a sense in which saving faith is not something that you take hold of. It's something that takes hold of you and controls your very life. The next section, James now finally turns to, to two examples from the Hebrew Bible to, to further demonstrate that where there is living faith, there will be works. Verse 20, he says this, uh, Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith, apart from works, is useless? Faith that does no work doesn't work. Faith that does no work doesn't work. It's, it's useless, he's saying. Verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and was counted to him as righteousness. He was called a friend of God. Now you end up having to be pretty familiar with the story of Abraham in order to understand James's point here. In Genesis chapter 12, uh, God spoke to this man named Abram that he'd later rename Abraham. He spoke to him, commanding him to leave his country and his people and his family, to abandon his worship of false gods, of pagan gods, and to head west to the land of Canaan, where God would give him children, children who would then grow into a great nation to fill that land of Canaan and to somehow be a blessing to all the families of the earth. And Abraham, having heard this word from God, this command from God, he believed, and so he obeyed. And once he made it to the land of Canaan, even though Abraham and his barren wife Sarah were both quite elderly, God spoke to him in Genesis 15 and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars. If you are able to number them, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. The Hebrew here is communicating that God is accounting to Abraham, is crediting to Abraham a righteousness that does not inherently belong to him. It's an external righteousness received by faith. That's what the text says. That's what the Apostle Paul spells out for us as he quotes from this verse, Deuteronomy, or Genesis 15, 6. He quotes from it both in Galatians chapter 3, Romans chapter 4. Here how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 4. He says this, For if Abraham was justified by works, well, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? It says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, well, his faith is counted as righteousness. Whereas Paul put it a few verses earlier, Romans chapter 3, verse 28, he says, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. That's clearly what Genesis 15, 6 means. Abraham was counted as righteous. He received righteousness through faith. But immediately after quoting that same verse, James says, verse 24, You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Well, which is it? Are we justified by faith alone or by faith plus works? Is this the contradiction in the Bible? No, not, not at all. The differing contexts of these passages make clear each person's, each author's point. Romans and Galatians are addressing the error 
of somebody trusting in their obedience to God's law in order to establish their own righteousness before God. Romans and Galatians make clear that is useless. James, on the other hand, is addressing a different error. He's addressing the error of trusting in a kind of faith that doesn't lead to obedience, which is likewise useless. This is why James begins by focusing on Abraham's obedience in offering up his son Isaac on the altar in Genesis 22. Well, when, when Abraham did that in Genesis 22, it's around 30 years after God had already declared him to be righteous in Genesis 15, on the basis of faith alone, which James then quotes, saying that that is being fulfilled in Abraham's obedience. James's point is that that faith from Genesis 15, verse 6, that was counted as righteousness, that faith proved itself genuine in the act of obedience 30 years later in Genesis 22. Because faith that is never completed by works is not genuine. The faith that saves is made evident in obedient action. Getting back to that particular act of obedience in Genesis 22, it's seemingly out of nowhere. Uh, God tested Abraham, it says, Genesis 22, verse 1. God tested Abraham, commanded him, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And Abraham obeyed. But as Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him there was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. And Abraham went over and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And so it was that on a mountain in Moriah, quite possibly the exact same location, that that ram was offered in the place of Abraham's only son. God the Father did not withhold his only son, whom he loved the Lord Jesus Christ, offering him up in the place of all who place their trust in him for the forgiveness of their sins. Jesus is the long-promised offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through whom all the families of the earth will be blessed. So have you fully entrusted your eternal life to Jesus, sacrificed in your place? Are you actively resting in his saving grasp? If you are, then you know what it is for that faith that you have in Jesus to take hold of you, to compel you to now walk in obedience to Christ's command. Now certainly, uh, his word doesn't command you and test you in precisely the same way that it tested Abraham as he was commanded atop that mountain in Genesis 22. Uh, but the episode with Isaac, it was, it was a one-time event foreshadowing what took place in Christ's cross. Even so, you're not going to be commanded to do that, but you too must equally be willing to sacrifice everything in service to him. Christ's words to us in the Gospels uh, make this abundantly clear. You must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. There's a point of application there as we look at Abraham's faith atop that mountain. Furthermore, like Abraham, we are to trust God and that his ways are best even when those ways don't seem best to us. It certainly didn't seem best to Abraham to take his only son and to sacrifice him atop that mountain. But he obeyed, trusting that God's ways are best. Uh, relating this to the topic from last week of loving our neighbor as ourself, uh, this may be the most challenging point of application for us in our day, trusting that love for our neighbors includes calling them to likewise submit to God's revealed will for our lives, even though we know that calling them to this will quite possibly greatly anger them and may be seen as hateful rather than loving. 
question is, will you, like Abraham, trust that God's ways are best, even when those ways don't seem best to you? That's a point of application from Abraham's faith for us. Will we trust that God's ways are best? Finally, James gives one other final example, turning from the father of the Jews to a Gentile woman, turning from Abraham, the patriarch, to Rahab, the prostitute. Verse 25. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received messengers and sent them out by another way. Uh, you can take a note and read about that episode in Joshua chapter 2 uh, where Joshua sends two spies into the promised land across the Jordan River into Jericho. Uh, their presence and whereabouts are discovered by the king of Jericho uh, so their lives are in danger but Rahab, a prostitute there in Jericho, decides to hide them. Why? Why help these spies from a foreign people coming to conquer the land? Well, she does it because she had heard about what God had done in the Exodus. She had come to believe that, quote, the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And this faith in God then made itself evident in action. Rahab's faith was not a lifeless faith, it was a living faith. It bore the signs of life. As James concludes, verse 26, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also, so also faith apart from works is dead. As the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. The word spirit here is, is taking on the traditional meaning of breath. Uh, the New Living Translation translates as, as breath. It's saying that if a body is breathing, you know it's alive. If it's not breathing, you know that it's dead. Well, so also, is if, if faith is breathing out works, you know that it's alive. If it's not, you know it's dead. James led into this whole section here at the end of chapter 1 with a call to care for widows and orphans, and in chapter 2 with a rebuke about showing partiality to the rich at the expense of the poor, and then with an illustration in our passage here about meeting the physical needs of fellow Christians. So all these examples of, of charitable acts of mercy, but, but that's just one application of his broader concern. The examples of Abraham's faith that are cited here it has nothing to do with charitable acts. The example of Rahab's faith, faith only loosely relates to generosity shown to others. Instead, these examples serve to advance the, the broader principle about faith being made evident in obedience. Faith is made evident in obedience. Showing concerns for the needs of others is just one of the signs of life of the living faith. But as we'll further elaborate in the rest of the letter here, so too is controlling our tongues, chapter 3, encountering other corrupting influences of the world, chapter 4. Ultimately, the whole letter is about being doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. It's a letter about self-deception. Returning to the topic of the great global baby bust, that's just one example of a nation's desperate need for its citizens to be doers of God's word and not hearers only. Of the citizens needing to obey God's command to be fruitful and multiply and to receive children as a heritage from the Lord. As we zoom in our, on our own lives and we consider the biggest danger facing our souls, may we not be self-deceived like those to whom James is writing. May our faith in Christ be true, the kind of faith that is made evident in obedient action to all that God has revealed. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word to us. Lord, we pray that your word, the implanted word, would take hold of our hearts, our minds, our lives. That we may be a people who are known for our love, as our faith breathes out works of mercy and loving kindness towards others. Lord, bless the preaching of your word, that it may do this work. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen.